Okay, this is a black male initiative uh, community night. Sometimes we show a documentary or uh, in this case we have um, speakers that will come in to expose you know, students and community members alike to um, a range of critical issues or topics, his, uh, history, you know, often suppressed or marginalized aspects of, of history uh, to the community for a robust you know, exchange afterwards and tonight will be no different. Um, Black Male Initiative, for those that don't know, this, it was an organization that was founded by two students who then brought Dr. Ziegler and myself in. And so the four of us um, founded this program in 2005. And initially it was to increase the retention rates of, of black men on campus, of African men on campus. And since then it's, it's morphed and grown into something much more than that. You know, going to Oak, then Oak Hill Juvenile Detention Center, which is now New Beginnings, sending students and um, uh, uh, staff and faculty through Oak Hill on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to do Sundays to do workshops with um, young men who are incarcerated at Oak Hill New Beginnings, and then to uh, set up reentry programs for that when they got out. That you know um, we had a support unit for them, and you know we're weaving them into you know activities on this campus, whether they were matriculated college students or not. It didn't matter to us. You know, Nambu is, is their home as well, so. Um, uh, BMI has, has been responsible for different kinds of programs and we continue to do outreach at middle schools and high schools. Without further ado, um, like I said, I'm Solomon Kamish, I'm Assistant Director for the New Brewer Culture Center and Dr. Ronald Ziegler is um, uh, our director and uh, he's going to introduce our, our two speakers but I also just want to say a couple words about the two speakers. I've known them for quite some time, especially Jared. I've known Jared since you know I came on campus <coughs> And back in two, August of 2000, um, this is a really, really um, important topic today. This is um, what these brothers have been doing for quite some time with this book and even with other books, to because um, a lot of folks will try to reinvent history. All right, and in this case, we're, we're talking about the life and legacy of, of Al Haj Malik Al Shabazz, otherwise known as Malcolm X. And so, um, I'm really looking forward to this, um, particularly, but. Um, their track record speaks volumes, and so um, I'm happy that it finally came to fruition. We've been working on this for about a year, but I'm, I'm glad that you know we were finally able to, uh, to bring you brothers here. You know. And this happened because of your commitment and Dr. Ziegler's commitment, so we want to say that publicly, that they worked very hard to make sure that this happened because they wanted uh, to expose uh, you to this. So we thank them for, for their work in doing it. Thanks a lot. Right. Appreciate it. Dr. Ziegler. Solomon. Okay, uh, we have a very uh, intimate audience here tonight. That means that everyone will have an opportunity to express their opinion and also engage our two distinguished scholars here tonight, Dr. Jared A. Ball and Dr. Todd S. Burroughs, in dealing with this whole issue of a lie of reinvention. So, uh, both scholars along with myself for, I guess, Alumni of University of Maryland, and also uh, Dr. Manny Marable, uh, may so rest in peace, is also an alumnus of the University of Maryland History Department. So we're going to deal and investigate this topic and investigate it as scholars, uh, realizing that uh, within scholarship, there's always different perspectives. Everyone's point of view is going to be respected, but we're going to analyze it, and within the spirit of academic freedom, uh, address those issues in terms of a lot of reinvention about the life of Malcolm X and what are some of the myths and truths associated with uh, the last scholarly book of uh, Dr. Mar Mar Marable. So I'd just like to uh, thank Dr. Ball, Dr. Burroughs for coming here tonight during Black History Month. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to come here and share with our Nabu students and faculty and staff and, and guests and visitors. We thank our visitors for coming out tonight. And we ask that you definitely 
ask whatever questions you have because both scholars are, are more than proficient and more than prepared to deal with the issues as it relates to this text. So again, thank you for coming out. Enjoy the discussion and let it begin. Thank you. Now, can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Right? Okay, great. Now, uh, again, it's an honor to be here at the Borough. I, I remember when this place was being built, I, I was in grad school here for a very long time, uh, from 1992 to 2001. So I remember the controversy over the uh, taking away the black scholarship and uh, that started you know, the campus movement and that I remember the world being one of the concessions that this historically racist university made for black students. So I, I remember when the first brick was being put here. So it's an honor to speak here and it's an honor to be introduced by the director of the center. Dr. Borum and I are used to teaching. Uh, so what we want to do, instead of giving you a speech, we want to give you some very brief presentations, and then we want the dialogue to come through. All right. So I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes maximum. <coughs> Dr. Ball is going to talk, and then we're going to open it up. And you know what? We're, we're an intimate group. We're a family group. You feel free to ask us things. Ask us the most basic questions you want, all right? Because we want, we want you to know about this topic. We do have books in the back if you want to buy books, but it's more important to us that you understand the basics about Malcolm X, all right? Particularly this year. This year, Saturday, is the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Malcolm X. One of the greatest crimes uh, committed against an African in the 20th century. Uh, this October will be the 50th anniversary of the publication of the autobiography of Malcolm a book that literally changed the lives of a generation of black people, at least one generation of black people. So this is a very significant topic to us. We uh, have committed our lives to certain aspects of the struggle that Malcolm has dedic Malcolm dedicated his life to. So we take this topic very, very seriously. All right. That's why we want to make sure to introduce you to what's at hand. So, for those of you who haven't followed uh, what happened with Manny Marable, with the biography of Malcolm X, let me just give you a one minute summary recap, right? As they see on TV, like previously on, right? give you that one minute recap, right? Before you watch the show, let, let me give you a one minute recap. All right? Previously on Black Scholarship, right? <laughs> the autobiography of Malcolm X for the last 50 years has been the number one source on Malcolm X, right? This began to be replaced in 1992 when Spike Lee came out with his movie, Malcolm X. Now, I don't want to embarrass anybody here, but this is a private gathering, so I want to, I want to just ask a question. How many people here read the autobiography of Malcolm X? Raise your hand. Be honest. Okay, that's fantastic. That's more than, than I would get at Morgan State, where I taught alongside Dr. Ball. How many of you have seen the Malcolm X movie, the Spike Lee movie? Okay. Normally what happens is we get about five people out of 25 who've read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and we get almost the entire amount with the movie. Now, talking about the movie is a whole other topic. We're not going to talk about that. But I'm just talk, telling you about how this dialogue went in terms of Malcolm X's viewpoints and what viewpoints of Malcolm X gets put out. Right. So the autobiography is the main book, then it's the movie, then Manning Marable, a major black scholar, decides he's going to do a biography on Malcolm X. Now, it was originally going to be a political biography, uh, but then the people who are in charge of book publishing, and there's only about, what, three companies now, right? Well, the, the, well I think they say officially there's six major global publishers. Right. But still, right. a handful. So one of these six came to Manning Marable with, I've heard a six-figure check, I heard a seven-figure check. When they come with this kind of check, you're supposed to do a full biography. Now, what the publisher is interested in uh, is details that will sell a book. There are many books that don't even get printed because the people involved don't want to dish dirt on the subject, right? But when they come with this check, implicit in that is that you want to dish some dirt. So Manny Marable does this full biography of Malcolm X 
where he makes some very controversial assertions. Uh, Malcolm's parents were involved in murder. Um, what's, what's another assertion? He said that he cheated on Betty. That he cheated on Betty. That Betty cheated on him, his mm -hmm. wife, Betty Shabbat. Uh, the most explosive one was, was that Malcolm was involved in some homosexual activity, right? And that became, by the way, the news item, because, you know, the news media mm -hmm. went and took the most sensational thing, as <laughs> news media does. And so they, that's, that's what, you know, you look up. If you look up about, this, about the Manny Marable book, you'll see, in terms of major media, Malcolm X is gay, right? Mm -hmm. Now, regardless of whoever's gender orientation is, you know, whatever that is, you've got to document these things. And we found, when we got the book, that... Manning Marable did a very bad job of documenting this. Now, Manning Marable is a major black scholar. And what made the situation even crazier was that he died the weekend before the book came out. So here you have this book out by now this martyr of black studies who you now can't challenge, who you now can't question. So the book comes out. Many of us see the holes in the book. Some people want to be polite. But Dr. Ball, who is one of the major activists of our generation, and that's just the truth, is more about the truth than about being polite. So a former Black Panther, Paul Coates, who has a publishing company, Black Classic Press, this is, a, this is one of the two major black book publishing countries in the country, in the country came to Dr. Ball, not anybody else. They could have chose anybody in the country. They came to Dr. Ball and said, will you produce an anthology critiquing this Manning Marable book? And as Dr. Ball was wont to do, he drags me into these kind of things, where I come in kicking and screaming, and then I get excited about whatever we're going to do. So we went and produced this book with a group of scholars who are mostly our age. Now, Keep in mind, we're in our mid to late 40s. For people like Manny Marable, we are still youth. Okay? So you guys get called youth by us. Well, we're still getting called youth by them. Right? So we come out with this book, and we get ignored. We get this. I'll let Dr. Ball tell, tell that whole story. But let me just give you my critique of what Manny Marable did with this book called Malcolm X, A Lie of Reinvention. Uh, a life of reinvention. I'm sorry, Steve. Right, right, right. Slipping it up, slipping it. <laughs> we call our book a lie of reinvention, right? We, we mess with Manny Marable's title. I'm a biographer, a wannabe biographer. I'm a historian, and I know that there are just four rules of how to produce a biography. One, you over-research. Two, you go where the subject went. Three, you interview everybody. And four, you separate your views from your subject's views. I found that Manning Marable did not do any of these four in producing this Malcolm X book. And when we talk about that, you know, we'll give you some details about that. And so that was my critique. Now, we have other people in this book. Uh, Mumia Abu-Jamal, you may have heard of him, political prisoner. Uh, Kali Apuno, uh, Raymond Winbush. We have somebody who worked with Malcolm X, A. Peter Bailey who was the editor of Malcolm X's newsletter. And so we compiled a group of people. Sorry? Rosemary. And Rosemary Mealy, thank you, who also worked with Malcolm X. So we, we compiled a group of people to go through Manning Marable's work and critique it. And like I said, we call our book a lie of reinvention. And we, we've caught hell for it ever since. And we're happy to do so. Uh, so that's all I'm going to say right now. I'm going to let Dr. Ball talk, and then we'll, then we'll open up. That was good. Thank you. I was trying to make it short. <laughs> um, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, I, I want to echo the sentiments of my colleague here in, in, in appreciating the invitation um, and you all for coming out, you know, given the weather, given all that else that is going on in the world. You know, we, we appreciate you coming out. Um, and as was said, we do take this topic very seriously. Uh, um, what I want to do, I just want to take a few minutes to, uh, yeah, so, in, well, to that, into that point that we take it seriously, so we're happy 
uh, to, to, to speak with any size group, anytime, anywhere. Um, because not only was Malcolm X so important, but the ideas that he worked with and represented are so important. And for me, that was really uh, uh, my biggest concern with the Marable book, and I'll come back to that in, in a quick second. Um, yeah, there's a lot that we could that, that, that could be said, and, and perhaps during Q&A we can talk a little bit about the process by which this book was put together. Uh, and as Dr. Burroughs said, I did want to grab him for help with this book, because not only as uh, Paul Coates and I had discussed, but as, as uh, I think a number of us think was important, the goal wasn't to, you know, we, we didn't want this to be an individual project of any kind. We wanted it to, it to be a collective response. And as one of our contributors, uh, Patricia, Patricia Reed Merritt points it out, or puts it, the uh, black radical collective consciousness uh, had been assaulted by Manny Marable's book. So it needed a collective response, and that's what we wanted it to be. Um, and for all the praise he heaped on me, Dr. Burroughs is, is unfortunately too quietly one of, if not the leading expert of our generation, not only on many aspects of black history, but specifically the black press and its relationship uh, to, to political struggle in history. So, um, uh, and being a good friend of mine, I couldn't have imagined doing something like this without him. And plus, there was a, a weight to it. You know, we do take Malcolm seriously. We didn't, I didn't want to be um, at all in any way solely responsible for any sort of uh, uh, collection of responses without some, some serious help. Because what we think we wanted to, what we wanted to do was what we think Marable and his crew did not do enough of, which is to have a collective con a contribution to not only what the book, what went into the book, but to how well it was put together um, and how well it was, was uh, um, uh, vetted for its accuracy. Um, so as we can talk about, when Dr. Burroughs mentions that a lot of the, the response to Marable's book was around this assertion that uh, Malcolm X was gay. This was not the first time that this has occurred uh, in, in, in so-called scholarship. Um, but as, as I forget actually which one of our contributors points it out, it may be Greg Thomas, it may be Ray Winbush, it may be both of them or, or several others. It's not only that, and I'm just using this as an example, it's not only that, that there was a claim that Malcolm was gay, but there was a claim based on uh, uh, hearsay, based on uh, speculation without evidence, and where on page 66 at the beginning of Marable's book there's this, there's this conversation about whether or not uh, Malcolm's retelling of someone else's story, in other words, saying that uh, he heard from someone else, someone put powder on some other man as some sort of pro process of, of uh, 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 youthful prostitution for, for white men. Um, by the end of the book, Malcolm is just listed as a homosexual, again, with no evidence. So the issue for me, with using this as an example, was that Marable had put together massive claims about Malcolm, including this one, without any real evidence in a book that was claiming to become be the new definitive product on Malcolm. And by definitive, we mean that it will be taught for the rest of your lives, the rest right. of your children's lives, that this will be the book on Malcolm X. And they said very specifically that they wanted this book to be what replaced the autobiography as that definitive text, that this was Marable and Viking Press's goal to produce something. Because part of what Marable does in his book, and we can again talk about this more if you all would like, is that he, he attacks the accuracy of the autobiography while replacing it. So, so, in, 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 so just sort of, in theory, replace it with his own as, the, again, the go-to book. So now when universities or other uh, uh, institutions or anyone else wants to go find the book on Malcolm, they'll go to Marables, even above and beyond Malcolm's own autobiography, which does have flaws in it, which we talk about. Um, uh, but instead of isolating and identifying the flaws in the book and showing how his is an improvement, they just say, they just sort of say it without proving it, without demonstrating it. And as anyone can think about with anything, you hear something, whether it's on a street corner or at the store or wherever in the, in the family discussion, you want to be, you want to, particularly if it's, if it's incendiary, if it's a big time claim, you want someone to verify the source. 
And we all have people in the family like, well, you know, Uncle Jimmy's not the real source for that kind of information. <laughs> Maybe we need to check, you know, with, with someone else in the family to make sure that what Uncle Jimmy is saying is true. Well, Marable didn't even do this on the level of journalism or scholarship or something as big as this with the major support of an institution, of an Ivy League institution, with a research staff, etc., that most scholars uh, honestly don't get. Now, for me, the real issue is, is, is just this, and I, and I just want to use the rest of my few minutes to, to uh, initially here to talk about it from this way. That there is, <clears throat> with everything, there is a, a need to brand something. Um, and in this case, whether it's selling shoes or T-shirts or universities, uh, or in this case, uh, revolutionary scholars or revolutionary activists, um, there's a need to brand it in a certain way so that the brand carries on uh, its own function. So in other words, when you see the Nike swoosh on a shoe or a shirt, that, that symbol is meant to take you away psychologically from the process that went into creating the shoe, to, to, to take you away from any logical question about is the shoe or shirt actually better than another shoe or shirt, to take you away from logically thinking about the cost of the shoe or the shirt. All of those things, the brand is supposed to wipe away your ability to think logically so that you just, we all just want to go for the brand. Well, the same thing happens with scholarship. The same thing happens with, with, with figures such as Malcolm X and what they represent. So what, what Marable's book ends up doing is becoming, as I and others have argued, an attack on your generation and those coming up behind you. And the point I'm making here is that there has always been a goal, in fact stated explicitly uh, in the counterintelligence program and under the FBI, that there is a goal here to make sure that black youth coming up after the 60s and 70s do not associate themselves with radical politics. So there has been a long effort to rebrand radicalism and radical figures, including Malcolm X, so that by the time they come down to my generation and certainly to yours, there is, there is a version of them that doesn't inspire us to do the same thing. And, and if I could just say, Marable taught at Columbia University, an Ivy League institution. So this idea that Dr. Ball is talking about starts from the top and gets into the uh, system, as it were, of black studies. So then black studies begins to be redefined. And how do the powers that be make sure that it's redefined? You give the Marable book the Pulitzer Prize, the top award you can win in American letters for history. Now, who gives out the Pulitzer Prizes? <laughs> Columbia University. <laughs> See? So you reinforce this idea that, okay, now we're going in another direction. We're going to take black studies and go in another direction. So you start that from the top, and then people get their cues from the middle. And, and then so, things get redefined. So, what ends up happening is that um, Viking Press, the publisher, works with Marable, and, and I think over time, uh, since we published the book, even more was done by Viking Press and its lead editor, Wendy Wolf, than, than Marable himself, in creating a product, a brand, using, turning to, uh, using the Malcolm X brand to sell a new product. And this new product is not really, again, as brands do, meant to give you who Malcolm X really was, but to give you a version of Malcolm X that will take you away logically from what he represented into some new space. So to do that, they, create, they want to create a bestseller so they can make all this money uh, 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 and pay out all these sums of, 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 of you know, funds and, and advances, whatever, to Marable and his staff, uh, and then mostly to the editors and the, and the publishing house itself. But so that to do that, they have to make a product that is, is, is accessible to an audience that makes books best-selling books, which is white, mainstream, middle-class, or affluent uh, uh, readers. So to get that audience to buy a book about Malcolm X, you have to create a version of Malcolm that never really existed, because the one that really existed is Wendy Wolf, the publisher, the head editor of, of, for the publishing house, Viking Press said in her own uh, uh, words in a presentation she gave, the real Malcolm X scared her. So in other words, so in, 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 to, in order to create a product that is not scary to her own audience, you have to do a number of things, and then I'll wrap it up here, which is primarily you have to um, attack the idea of nationalism and what nationalism means. You have to attack the idea, all the other ideas that Malcolm was working with and associated, which, which would include nationalism, pan-Africanism, socialism, armed struggle, radical electoral political movements, that is, 
using black votes to collectively vote not for the reigning Democratic Party uh, appointee, but actual other, uh, uh, well, as he said in his own words, uh, uh, people from the community who would represent the community to the best of their ability, as opposed to top-down, handed-down politicians sponsored by Wall Street who are promoted heavily that we then go and vote for. That was not what Malcolm was saying. Um, so all of these ideas have to be attacked, and they are attacked. And we, have, you know, I'll stop here in a moment. We can talk all about it. But those ideas are attacked through this 600-page book that Marable produced um, consistently. So he, the attacks on Garvey and the Garvey movement, the attacks on uh, Kwame Nkrumah and what he represented in terms of pan-Africanism and socialism, uh, attacks on the ideas of armed struggle, a complete rewriting, and, and I and others have identified where, where Marable literally truncates, that is, cuts off pieces of Malcolm's statements and refashions them, uh, fashions them to support a point about the use of the vote and other things that are completely antithetical or in opposition to what Malcolm was actually saying. Um, all of this to produce a document that in the post-Obama era would be something that would, would position, and this is really, and I'll stop here, where I primarily found the flaws in this, this, this presentation, that would position Barack Obama as the logical conclusion of what Malcolm X represented. To say that, that this moment that we have now with Barack Obama is the moment that Malcolm and others like him uh, uh, presaged or prefaced. And we had a major writer. Yeah who happened to be the son of our publisher, write that. Right. That was interesting, too. Right? And, and... So, so, so yeah, let me just wrap this up here. That, 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 um, and let me just say, by the way, there's much more to get into. There's much more that we have. Uh, and if you ever take the time or would like to take the time, obviously we invite you to read our book. But uh, you can go to imixwhatilike.org and for free spend as much time as you like getting to all the text and audio and video uh, when we talk more about uh, um, uh, this book and this work and its importance and its meaning. Um, and, but, uh, but I'll stop there uh, and let you offer up questions or comments, critiques or anything, and then we can uh, have a better, more, more Ask the most basic questions. We know we've given you a lot to deal with. Yeah, we said a lot. Deal with. Know, so yeah. if you want to ask the most basic question about Malcolm X, do so, because we want you to know about Malcolm X. That's the purpose of this tonight. Yes. Do you feel as though the movie was another thing that also sort of went with the whole brand and not really represented oh, yeah. who Malcolm X really was? Like they Don said it. They said it. I'm sorry, real quick. At that ahead. time, they said it. Warner Brothers Studios said very explicitly in the early 1990s, we want to create the X as a brand on par with, with Batman and The Simpsons. Mm -hmm. So they said they were very clear, we need to rebrand X. And real quick, what people have to remember is that in the late, particularly in the mid to late 80s, Malcolm had become, had a resurgence mm -hmm. within my generation, yeah. through hip hop, yeah. through, through, through uh, you know, a new, gener you know, new generations being reconnected mm -hmm. through the radical hip hop that was being produced at the time that we had access to, unlike today. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so there was, this, there was this need from the state, that is the, the United States, not just the government, but its, its economic, political elite in general, to say, well, if all these black youth are reconnecting with Malcolm X, on what terms are we going to allow this to occur? We can't allow them to greet Malcolm as he actually was, because they might become him. And we don't want that. That's why we killed him in the first place. Mm -hmm. We can't have another generation producing another one. So they create, they said, we, so to, 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 to create and justify the cost or the, the presence of a movie like that in Hollywood, they have to rebrand him in a way that takes, walks us away from his radicalism and towards a more marketable version of himself. And if I could just give a, because we, we could talk about the movie all that, so I'm just going to, I got to narrow this to one minute, all right, on the movie. I got to stay with one minute. The movie is based on the autobiography, but it's only based on parts of it. Mm -hmm. It is also based on a screenplay that James Baldwin did when he tried to do a film on Malcolm X in the late 60s. Uh, and James Baldwin is the uncredited co-writer of that movie. Malcolm X is discussed in a way that Spike Lee decided to discuss in a way that allowed him to get money from Warner Brothers to make the movie. And even, and Oprah, and, and even, with, and even with Warner Brothers, there was still <laughs> wasn't enough, so he had to go to Oprah and Bill Cosby and a bunch of people. So there are points in the movie where Spike Lee said, I changed what he said here, I moved this speech to here, and I took this other speech out. 
because I didn't want to alienate the audience. So, for instance, let me give an example, and then we're going to be quiet. The movie is a whole thing. What's not in the movie is that Malcolm X went to the continent of Africa and met with 15 heads of state as a de facto ambassador from black America and was making arrangements with African revolutionaries who had become presidents of their countries because this was a period of time of, of uh, African uh, countries gaining independence from the European colonials. And he had made all these arrangements and, and produced a document that attacked the United States for white supremacy that was introduced in the Organization of African Unity meeting. None of that is in the movie. Why is that not in the movie? Because they don't want that to be part of the narrative. They want you to think Malcolm X was this guy who found this crazy religion, and then he got out of the crazy religion, and then he was shot tragically before he was able to join the civil rights movement. That's the, that's the narrative they've always tried to do. Even down with the autobiography, there are even issues with that, but we don't want to get too deep on that. So the movie is very problematic because it takes an impure document, the autobiography, because see, the autobiography, that's a whole other discussion we could have on what Alex Haley included, what he didn't include, what the publisher wanted, what the publisher didn't want, that's a whole other discussion. So you start with an impure document, and then you make an even more impure movie out of it. If you just watch it, by the way, real quick, if you, you know, if, if, it, it takes you 90 minutes into the film before you actually see Malcolm as Malcolm X. Right. So it is, you know, 90 minutes of the film is all about him as the hustler and the pimp and all that other kind of stuff. But what made him the person that made him relevant to all of us and that makes people want to know who he is, right. uh, is, is, is denied much access in, in the film. It's, it's, it's relegated to the smallest part of the film. Um, so included in, in, in what was not included is also what Marable did in his book, which is to, to uh, erase the guerrilla warfare element. And, and I don't want, again, I'm not up here encouraging violence or armed struggle, but I am saying that if we're going to talk about Malcolm X, this was part of what he was working towards. So um, in the book, so the movie doesn't deal with that at all, right? Because they want to create this narrative that he was once this angry black nationalist who, wanted, who called all white people devils. Then he went to Mecca, saw white people praying to the same Muslim God and got, got, you know, got saved, so to speak, pun intended, but, you know, it's not for um, saying. <laughs> and then... And then came back and saw a new day and wanted an integrationist civil rights movement here in the United States. And, and all of that is misleading and false from the multiple trips, the, the, the previous trip he had already made to Mecca, to, to, to his calling for uh, uh, saying that the white, when white people call themselves white here, it's different than when they say they're white in other parts of the world. Uh, he, there, they're just talking about a point of fact. Here, they mean boss. And then, of course, this element of armed struggle. That you, it messes up this clean narrative they're trying to recreate if you have a man who's saying, not only am I trying to re-engage with the civil rights movement, but I'm not trying to do it on some integrationist stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm saying they need to know that there's this alternative waiting, that right. if you don't give King what he wants in his way, we will get the guns out and we'll go another direction. And that's one of the things Selma got right, that conversation right. between mm -hmm. Malcolm X and Coretta Did you all see Selma? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that scene is correct. By the way, if you're interested in what Malcolm X did in Africa, there are now new books on that, so you can find them. One is the diary of Malcolm X, where some scholars printed his diary. He kept the diary while he was in Africa. And so you can read that. So if you're interested in the actual detail on that, that is now available. And then also, you know, so just finally on that point, when Marable talks about, so, so there's a part in the book, where, in Marable's book, where he talks about Malcolm meeting with uh, the man who's, who at the time was named Max Stanford with the Republic of New Africa. Um, but in Marable's book, that conversation or that interaction is only brought up so that Max can be used to comment on what he thought Malcolm's psychological state was at that time. None of the programmatic goals were discussed or the ideas were discussed. So you don't know yeah. that Malcolm was meeting with them because that was the group that was going to be the underground armed unit to Malcolm's above ground, above ground OAAU, or Organization of Afro-American Unity, and that they were going to, that was going to be, that, that part of the goal was to develop an urban guerrilla warfare movement. 
that part can't be put in the book that you're trying to use to become a bestseller for Viking Press. That's not interesting because white liberals who are looking for their Sunday book read over coffee don't want to be reading about black people picking up guns and going to war for their life, for their rights. They want to read that this man had this conversion and went from the devil that he was to something that could be put on a stand right. and marketed to, to, to ultimately you all are the target. The people in this room are the target. They want you to not be associated with these ideas. They don't want you to study Malcolm in the context of learning about, again, Pan-Africanism, socialism, radical nationalism, armed struggle. They don't want that. And by the way, the, the Panthers will celebrate their 50th anniversary next year. Watch and see if the ideas of the Panthers that they had, whether that's going to be discussed. They're going to show you the guns and, right. and all, but they're not going to talk about what they studied politically. Right. And see, what we're talking that's about cool. is, what we're talking about is, that Malcolm X was actually doing real work in trying to set up an African world in which Africa could stand up against the Western powers. But see again, Manning Marable was the de facto leader of this scholarship that said, no, no, what, what Malcolm X was really trying to do was he was trying to expand American democracy. And these are becoming the new catchwords <coughs> Uh, what black studies is trying to be now. Now it's trying to be about American democracy. When you go back and read what the people were saying, or if you go back and use the greatest tool we have right now, and you better use it before they take it from us, what am I talking about? What tool, do, tool we have right now where you get a lot of interesting black information from unedited? What? What is it? The internet. What, on, what specific site on the internet? Not Google. <laughs> right, Rose Stuart, right. that, that's one version. But there's one particular site where you can get all sorts of unedited information about black people, black politics, black history. What's it called? YouTube. That's right. And you better hurry up and use it because when YouTube becomes a paid site as they want it to be, because it still hasn't made a profit, they're going to wipe out all the information that's on YouTube right now. There are like five Malcolm X documentaries on YouTube. There are speeches from people involved with Malcolm X's movement and other movements, uh, scores of them. And they're all on right now because YouTube is this free medium. But that's going to change. So one of the places that you can go to get the real Malcolm X is YouTube. Because you'll hear his speeches uninterrupted. You'll hear uh, dialogues about him done by people who are not trying to get a seven-figure check. So that is, that is one of the, the, uh, the places to go. So it's the ideas behind these people that we want to discuss. Their lives are very significant. I'm a biographer. I believe in telling stories. But what we're afraid of is that people are telling stories without the ideas. So first they did it with Malcolm. Then next year they'll do it with the Panthers. They'll try to do it with Black Power, which will also be the 50th anniversary next year. And one of his protégés is, is, is just did it with the, his book on Stokely Carmichael. Um, uh, the, the, the book Stokely, A Life, mm -hmm. does the same thing. Um, distorts the ideas so that, that if you all happen to read the book, you won't be inspired to think along those same lines or behave those same. And by the way, I think it's important also to point out that the conditions that we all live in today are uh, in many ways worse than the conditions that faced Malcolm in his day. Um, if you look at the new report from Oxfam, by 2016, 1% of the world will be worth more than 99% of the rest of us. Uh, so the gap between rich and poor is wider today than it was when Malcolm was alive. We today have the longest, uh, the, the longest long-term unemployment rate among black America since 1948. Um, uh, the, 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 the relative black to white wealth and worth ratio has gotten actually worse just in the last couple of years. That is to say that the, the median net worth of a black family household at the, today is, is, I think, is, is about uh, $11,000 uh, compared to $144,000 for a white household. Uh, there are more black people locked up today than were held as slaves on plantations at the height of enslavement. I mean, we can go on and on and on, and yet the projection of black imagery suggests the opposite, suggests that, that things are getting better. So in fact, uh, uh, and I've argued this before, uh, I would say that we're in the worst state that we've ever been in, in the sense that um, despite 
the worsening material conditions, we are encouraged to believe that things are getting better. And I think that, that, that never before in our history has the gap between our, our real, the real conditions that we live and what we think of those real conditions has, has never been wider than it is today. I mean, even, uh, you know, obviously enslavement on a plantation is worse than what we're experiencing today. But even then, I think there was more clarity as to the condition than there is among us uh, now. What's, what's happened is that so, there have been a so, so just the goal, the goal has to be, as things continue to get worse, mm -hmm. there has to be an increased effort on assaulting the consciousness of those who are suffering those worsening conditions to make us think other than what we need to think about to make changes in it. And this is what, I, what I'm arguing, at least, that this book, this Marable book and, and, and associated discussions of it are just one small part of that process. Um, very quickly here, there's this quote I often bring up in class, I, I think it's credited to Noam Chomsky, but I think somewhere else that William Bloom might have said it, but that, that propaganda is to democracy what violence is to totalitarianism. And the simple point is that the freer you are told you are, the more propaganda has to be developed to make sure you don't actually behave as though you are free and you, your behavior is sort of managed. The, the, the more the more a dictatorial, the more totalitarian, or the more of a dictatorship you live in, the more overt they can be. The more they can, look, you do what I tell you to do, or I knock you over the head, and that's it. And everybody's clear, okay, I got it, I'm oppressed. But here we're told all the time we're free, things are better, it's more expansive, you have more opportunities, so on and so on and so on. So more has to be done to undercut that claim of freedom to, to, assault, to assault our psyche, to make sure we don't uh, move beyond those accepted boundaries. And just one minute to follow that up. De Tocqueville, who did the, the book, uh, Democracy in America, talked about that revolution was uh, very difficult in America because to have a revolution, you have to have the poor having absolutely nothing and the rich having absolutely everything. In America, the poor have access to food, shelter, and free technology. We talk about the library, right? So the material, possession, the material uh, conditions that Dr. Ball uh, is talking about gets kind of shunted or gets kind of phased out, where even the poor think they are powerful because they can go on Twitter. He also said this, that, the, that the pretense in America to, to having elected officials was more like having the nobles of the old Europe. There it is. Than, than there it is. Some sort of free. So, so this progression, and just to show you how this happened in my own lifetime, I turned 47 uh, yesterday. We used to be black people. And when I was born in 1967, there was a revolution going on in America, or at least insurrection. We were black people then. In my lifetime, we went from black people to Afro-Americans to black Americans to African-Americans. And now, with a black president, with the most powerful woman in media being black, with black people <coughs> heading Wall Street firms, with black people in every aspect of leadership, including two black secretaries of state, and you know, get a black president. Now the progression is that we are now Americans. To the point where we can now even make fun of the conflict, generational conflict, in a sitcom, Blackish, right? That's a little undercurrent of what Blackish is about. The the tension between the old black America and this new black America. So the Manning Marable Malcolm X book is part of that scholarship that says we're now Americans. So we don't have to worry about those things anymore. We don't have to worry about, about studying how to get out of the situation we're in by using people like Garvey or Karl Marx or Huey Newton. We don't have to study that anymore. And so the presentation that we get of these heroes, of these people who fought and struggled, is a presentation that makes sure to reinforce that we are Americans. But we've never been Americans. James Baldwin will tell you that. Go read any book done by James Baldwin, and he will tell you we're not Americans. James Baldwin wrote about the illegitimacy of America and the fantasy of American identity. That people will tell you he just wrote about race. He wrote much more, but he wrote much more than that. Race was just an aspect of what he wrote, but his larger themes was that this country is illegitimate. And so we are here illegitimately to foster part of an illegitimate idea known as America. Those things are no longer talked about because now the focus is on the legitimacy of America. Why? 
because we have blacks in all these powerful positions, including the White House. Do you all have any other yeah. comments, questions? Thank you. Responses, critiques? Yeah, I, uh, your last discussion was sort of interesting to me because I grew up in the uh, segregated South as a sharecropper. And many years later, uh, I was talking to black parents in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and they were talking about how segregation was bad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and during that uh, period, and it was a fascinating discussion because it gets wrapped up into we had a community fabric you know, the tie between uh, community, the black community, the church, your schools, et cetera, was this tight fabric. And today, they felt that black kids, um, particularly black males, are in the large schools. And if they aren't into sports, they don't, you know, they aren't a part of anything. It was like when I was in high school, I, in a black high school, I was in everything, you know, the choir to the football team, we own that, you know, and it always comes back to whether it's Marcus Garvey or other or someone else when we are talking about to be free to have your own community and your own way of thinking and an appreciation for your own history because all of those things get torn away. Uh, when you go into this sort of system, even in, and I'm going to end this, even in the university I've been reflecting on, uh, we have to adopt white people's theories, you know, and frequently those theories will divide who we are. And so your whole ability to sort of think and value yourself uh, becomes quite challenging. So I just want to throw sure. that out because it, it's, a, it's, you know, it's mixed up with all of this this stuff and people trying to find their own mental or intellectual emancipation so that we can. We hear what you're saying. We are the first and second black men to graduate from the College of Journalism, and there has yet to be a third. That is kind of crazy. Mm, well, well, I mean, yeah. uh, unless we, you know, talk about our experiences. <laughs> have any of you seen the, 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 uh, the Nas documentary that just came out last year? Nas, did you all hear that it even existed? Yeah. Huh? Was it Illmatic 20 or no? Yeah, it was, uh, well, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was about the making of Illmatic. Uh, Time is Illmatic, I think is the name mm -hmm. of the documentary. The reason I bring it up is because um, one, of the, one of the more powerful points in the documentary was when Nas is, you all know who Nas is, I'm, I'm at least assuming, right? Okay. Um, I was waiting for some, never mind, never mind, never mind, I was going to say But, but Nas, Nas's father tells a story of being from the Deep South and coming to, moving the family, you know, moving up to New York, having his family there, and, and recognizing the difference between what his experience was going to school and what he saw his sons experiencing in, in Queensbridge, New York. And he actually gets to the point where, and I think Nas is 16, where he says, I see what's happening to you in this school. It's sucking away your humanity. It's turning you into something else. Nobody there cares about you. It's not the school setting I went to. Uh, at least in the segregated South, we had you know, black teachers that cared about us and cared about our community. There was nothing like what I see you going through. He told his son to drop out, told his sons to drop out of high school. And said, if you have a dream, if you have a vision, chase it. That's why Nas didn't finish high school. And I thought it was one of the most powerful, and as a parent, revolutionary acts I think you could, you could, you could commit uh, and, and, and the strength that it must have taken. But that was his point. Um, and in this process of, of, of black families being dislocated, separated, and then having their children sent to, to schools run by, by hostile communities, it's produced generation after generation of, 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 of what was intended to produce. Um, I remember the first time, I think I was 15, 16, when, when a, a black elder told me, he said, for the first time, I'd never heard that before, that it was better for us under segregation. And, and I remember thinking, wow, that is not at all what I've ever been taught. Like, everything we've ever been taught is integration is good and everything is better now. And he, that was his exact point. Uh, so anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
And then, and then lastly, to the point of our here, that the radical traditions that come out of that experience are what are attacked, I think, by Marable in, in what he did to, in, 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 to Malcolm, and, and meant to be an attack on, again, I'm saying to the youngest people in this room, that they're meant, this, it's really meant to target you, because a book written even at this elite level, you may be thinking, look, I don't care about New York Times. What does the New York Times bestseller mean for me? I don't read it. I didn't read the book. I didn't read Mar Marable's 600 pages. What is, what's the difference? Well, we have to remember that, that that books like this become the read, they're read by the target audience I mentioned, white, affluent, uh, uh, middle class, liberal people, who then take the ideas out of these books and turn them into policy that affects your everyday life. Right. It's like when you go to Walmart and think you're saving money to buy something for a dollar, yep. you've not only contributed to, to this, this, this imperial corporation, that is, that is abusing laborers in China and underpaying workers here in the United States, but, you're, you're, but the, the, the money that the Walton family takes, six of whom right. are on the world's most uh, richest billionaires list, six of the Walton family members, there's six people on the top 15 richest people in the world. They, can you, they, I, I want that to hit home for a second. Yeah. One family has produced six people that are among the 15 richest in the world. All right, I, I, let that marinate. I think it needs. I think that need, it, it needs to have a greater resonance. But they take that money and they funnel it back into their conservative think tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 I believe they, they, they what, is, what is it? The Walton, the Walton Foundation and their funds. I believe uh, I need to double check this, but I believe they fund like the Bradley Institute and some other some other uh, uh, right wing conservative that that produce policies that get written for Congress people who then take those policies and make them law that ends up affecting us. So there is this ripple effect that goes into all of this that is meant to have a negative impact on, on the youngest among us. And, and even more practically, the study guides on Malcolm X will now change as a result of the Manning Mavra biography. So this may not matter to you, but if your kids go to public school and they take standardized tests, they're now going to get Manning Marable's version of Malcolm X and not the version we're talking about today. Because remember, YouTube's going to be a paid site by then, and there'll be something else. There'll be, you know, the internet in our bodies or something. Like, you know, <laughs> some, something, something crazy like that. So your kids will be getting the result of this misinformation we're talking about today. Yeah. Um, about a year ago, maybe, perhaps maybe it was longer than that, WPFW did a uh, critique, I guess, of the book. Guess what? It, how long has it been out? Came out April of 2013, right? Or 12. This came out. This came out in 2012. So did it come out in 2012? It's been, it's been a minute. Maybe 2011. It, it might, I, if I remember correctly, it might even be 2010. Remember. No, no, no. It was, it was, no, it was after. Okay. Well, okay. 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 this has been about two or three years. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I thought they that they raised some very interesting um, issues related to the whole thing, and, and what, what kind of disturbs me, and I haven't had the unfortunate opportunity to have read you know, the Life of Reinvention. No, but this is what I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of perplexed about. When it first came out, somebody said to me, uh, in the book they said Malcolm X was gay. So I said, well, hey, I, I don't even believe that. I mean, I don't care what they put in the book. I mean, regardless, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making this, I'm not trying to be disparaging, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I just knew that that was sabotage, mm -hmm. all right? So they associate this with Mary Mary. And WPFW raised the fact that, I don't know the exact, the exact time sequence, but there was a graduate student, or maybe several graduates, but one graduate student in particular, I guess that's when Madame Marable was ill, and he didn't have time to check his book out or whatever. And, you know, if, if we're going to attack Madame Marable for us a scholarship, you think there's a possibility, I mean, the whole revisionist history as a scholar that perhaps he didn't get a chance to check it. I mean, perhaps, yeah. perhaps he, you know, perhaps he was in collaboration no, no, with his grad student, but maybe he didn't have an opportunity to check it. And his grad student, as WPW pointed out, 
fabricated it, falsified it, and disparaged the man's name. Now you're about to get a story. No, you're not. <laughs> because we're on record, and we can't tell the full story mm -hmm. on record. Okay. Okay. But I will say this. The claim at the time was that Manning Marable had been working for upwards of 20 years on this book. And that over that time, he had developed not only a, a strong base of, of funding from his, this Ivy League institution, but a, a, a staff of, of research assistants in this, what was it, the Malcolm X Institute or something, something right. like that? Right, Malcolm X Institute. Um, when the book came out, it was, it was championed as this, not only as a book coming out by this, this and folks in the room, like you all, I, I get that you won't fully appreciate this, but, but, but Dr. Burroughs and I are sitting here where we really are, the way I like to make the analogy just real quick is that by virtue of, of having PhDs and teaching and, and publishing, we're in the NBA, so to speak. We're in the league, right? But we're like, honestly, no disrespect to either one of us, we're like the 15th, 14th, 15th man on the bench, okay? <laughs> Marable is the starting five. You know, he's in the starting five. If he's not LeBron, he's at least in the starting five, right, of scholars. So you have to imagine it like, like, like I was trying to think, you know, I couldn't even think of my Wizards. Who's the 15th man on the bench screaming at John Wall like, you suck, son. You made the worst mistake ever. You made, you ruined it. Like, he's going to be like, what you, you're the 15th man on the bench. You're barely on the team. So when, when Marable, so they're not only saying that, so the Marable's not only this superstar scholar, but he had this team. Research assistants, money, did 20 years of research. So when the book came out, and we, we, were, we were doing radio, uh, and I hope, I would like to think you were listening to our show on PFW. I yeah, know. I listened to your show. Oh, okay, so I don't know you know which one you heard. But, but our thing was, when we started doing interviews with Carl Evans in particular, uh, the book started becoming concerned. I contacted uh, Zahir Ali, was the, was the one named as Marable's chief researcher. Marable, we knew, had passed. I contacted Zahir Ali and said, look, I have, I alone have a number of problems with this book. But I don't want, but this is not about attacking Marable or anyone else. I just want some, some questions answered. I have a radio show. I will send you weeks in advance my full list of questions so that you and your staff have ample time to go through the questions Put your responses together, and I said, "You and all of you can come on the show." I was like, "You all, like, whoever you want." No response. Through some interesting production finagling with what was then Al Jazeera America, we ended up being interviewed on Al Jazeera with Zahir Ali, who, who, uh, I'll say, I can, I think, can at least say, did not expect us initially to be there. We do this interview. After the interview, I asked him, can we now get you to come on the show and discuss these issues? And he declined. What I encourage people so that I can avoid any potential problem is that wherever Zahir Ali is or wherever you feel like you can contact him, ask him if he is ever or would he be ever willing to respond publicly to these questions that we raise in our book, that others have raised, these are not attacks on anybody's in, in, you know, uh, 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 character. They're attacks on the scholarship and the work. Our book, for whatever people want to say, is a thoroughly researched, careful, I think uh, um, it's heavily critical, but fair in the context of being heavily critical, in that we, we look at the work and critique the work. We offer citations, we offer resources, we offer, we offer a, 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 a you know, competing analysis that goes beyond just we're angry at Marable and that's this and that. So what I would encourage is, is for people to ask Zahir Ali, what happened? Why haven't you been willing to meet or speak publicly on these issues with, with whether it's me or anybody else? In fact, what I also will say publicly, and I think it's fair to say, whenever we were, he and I were scheduled to be on a panel together, he declined. Once he found out I was going to be there, he, he Coincidentally, whatever happened, he no longer participated. It happened three times that I can document, where we were both invited to an event and he declined. So my point in saying all of that is that you have this collective that puts out this product and then is unwilling to stand up
to honest, principled critique. Um, again, he had the list of questions, or could have had the list of questions I was going to ask in advance, none of which was going to be anything salacious or, or hostile to them as in, individually. That's just, where's your evidence? How did you compile this evidence? How did you come up with your conclusions? They don't want to do it. They have not yet done it. I, we wrote, I wrote an open letter to, to, at the time, Tavis Smiley and Cornell West about their radio show. They in, interviewed Zahir Ali on there twice and didn't have any of us on to discuss it, even as they had a conversation with him about how Manning Marable, had he lived, would have wanted to engage the community and, and critique from scholars and peers and whoever that he would have wanted. They have avoided it. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, that's all I really think I can say publicly about it. But it, and I, I just wish I would, I just encourage whoever ends up seeing this online or anybody in the room, Contact Zahir here on me and just ask him whatever happened to these conversations. I told you we were going to get a story. I told you. It's a horse. That's a story we can tell. It's not even the bad. It's not even the real story we can tell. It's not even the, the, the that's the on the record story we can tell. It's just really frustrating. It is, I will say that it's really frustrating because people, uh, I think, continue to make a name off of Malcolm X for their careers, for their, for their whatever, and yet uh, are, are unwilling to even engage in principled public conversation about their work. And, you know, debating me isn't going to make or break your career. I mean, I'm not that big a deal, so it's not going to, you know, but I think if, if you're claiming to want to represent the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the legacy of Malcolm X and the honesty with which he worked and in which he engaged in all of his dealings, then I think that people should be willing to have a public conversation with, with uh, me or anyone else who has a, a sound critique of the book. And they don't do it. They won't do it. Dr. Ball is very humble here. The reality is, when we talked with him, he, it was the only time, it was the only time he had, Zaire Ali had ever been on with somebody else. Every interview Zaire Ali did when that book came out was by himself. So it was the only time that he ever got challenged was through us. And, I, and ironically, it's, it's on Al Jazeera America, which you can no longer, it's Al Jazeera English, which you can no right, longer right, see. Right. You can't even see it anymore. Yeah. Because Al Jazeera America yeah. wants to create a softer version of Al Jazeera <laughs> to make money, yeah. so they shut down Al Jazeera English. So you can't even see the debate that we have with him, which is very ironic. But, but that's, that's, you know. <laughs> Let me, let me jump in before. Yeah. Um, I, I, have, I have a question uh, to ask both of you, and I, there's just you know two parts of the question that you know I, I think are linked up to one another and, and will make it relevant. Your advice to students in this room right now, um, given the fact that uh, a lot of these students have been trained, and and the students that are um, a part of, we, we actually have a. a uh, an African history and uh, cultural and, and political education uh, book club that we meet mm -hmm. once a week. Right now, we're, as Victor knows, and Muftal knows, we're um, dissecting um, Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And, and you know, we funnel that into to work that we can, you know, do in the, commu in the community and, and, you know, what's relevant today from that book to, you know, what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. So they've heard this from me you know, in terms of being skeptical about the academy, that a, a lot of students, though, are taught that, you know, you come into, you know, come into the academy, you know, this university, this prestigious, you know, college, whether it's Columbia or, or what have you, or University of Maryland, you go into the classroom, and almost like, you know, what's said there is like, is like the law. But a, as we know, um, you know, university is becoming more and more liberalized, you know, more and more, you know, diluted, you know, students can come into a classroom and literally, um, you know, be obfuscated in terms of, you know, um, history, you know, not just our history as African people, but just history in general, totally being taken out of context. And so my, my question is, and, and also to add to that, when you, you, you mentioned, uh, and I think, Todd, you alluded to that, it, you know, you, you said right now, jump on YouTube, jump on YouTube. And I think last time, Jared, you were um, on the panel here, you know, with Obi and, and, and some other folks, um, you know, this was raised as well, is that, that right now, if you're serious about finding, about finding out the truth about Malcolm, 
There are books there. I mean, for God's sakes, you can go onto YouTube and you can hear from the man's voice himself and, and get audio, get, you know, speeches and, and listen to, to Malcolm himself tell you what he thinks on certain issues. Given what, what I just said about the academy, would you advise, you know, students to, to start, you know, their own scholarship regarding Malcolm and, and not just Malcolm, but other heroes and sheroes such as whether Ella Baker or Kwame Ture, and even looking at the fact that, you know, that book, the autobiography of Malcolm X changed my life, but also, as you know, that there were components taken out of it because we know now that Alex Haley was collaborating with, with the feds, the, the FBI, and, and there was a significant, you know, part of that book taken out, you know, especially like looking at, you know, um, you know, his work that he was trying to do with the OAU and, you know, and, and that, and they didn't want that. They didn't, they definitely didn't want that information out there for folks to say, damn, this is a fucking good idea. So what's, what's your advice to them? Like, what, what should they do knowing that there's all this misinformation out there? How about you do that? Well, I mean, I, I think, first of all, that you need to have this reading group is a great start. Um, and I would just say, always remember that these institutions are not here to teach us. Uh, I mean, the institution doesn't exist to teach us this history so that we can act on it and make the change that these people were assassinated for trying to make. Um, what I also often say to students is that this is the best time in your life, or maybe the only time in your life, where you will have built into your life, uh, linked up with your age and your health and your strength and your ability to stay up for hours and remember things, to study. Like, and I don't mean study for your classes, although that's an important component of being a student, but you have the ability and the time and the flexibility of, of your life to really take in all kinds of information that is not coming straight through the classroom. Most people, I think, will tell you that some of the best learning they've ever experienced happens outside of the classroom. So um, I would. I would encourage you to do what more just what you're doing now. Keep studying. Keep taking advantage of the moment that you have now. Take advantage, as, as Dr. Pearl said, of the YouTube moment that exists because it's not going to be here much longer. Get all this information and then find new ways to contribute to it, to fill in gaps, to make it relevant to your generation, to your particular experiences. Um, and then finally, extend those ideas. All those ideas that made Malcolm the powerful force, the inspiration, the hero, and again, Pan-Africanism, socialism, nationalism, uh, 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 armed struggle, real grassroots organization, non-mainstream electoral voting politics. I mean, these are all the things. Grapple with those ideas. I'm not saying you have to follow them exactly as he did or whatever, but take those ideas and inform, learn them, study them, inform them, and, and, and bring them into the mixture of the things that you're doing. I think that's the best thing any of us can do, never mind just you. So just real quickly, you said non-electoral politics, and I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, but I just want to put it, put it out there. So you look at Pinel, Pinel Joseph and that, that piece of rubbish that he produced, um, I forget, I think it was his second to last book. From, from Black Power. Yeah, from, yeah, so he's saying that Barack Obama is like the culmination yes. of, of Black Power. Is he right or wrong? And if he's wrong, why? I mean, he's damn wrong. I mean, See, this is now, now remember, Peter Joseph is a protege of Manning Marable, and part of what he is trying to do, as he told me, he wants to be the next Henry Louis Gates. So he wants to be the, the mainstream, well funded, well paid, conventional, go to, definitive historian that's not going to encourage any of these ideas. And if you ever look at what Henry Louis Gates says about Malcolm and Kwame Ture and all these ideas we've been talking about, he hates them and he's so explicit about it. He's just up here as louder than I'm being right now. Nationalism is terrible. Kwame Ture was irrelevant. Malcolm X was wrong. No, 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 no. This is who, who Peniel wants to be even as he wants to be the, 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 the when I call him the founder, uh, what formerly the father of black power studies. This is, this is, so no, so, so well, the tricky place is that black power <coughs> phrase has been defined differently by different people forever. So what he does is he takes the most conservative definition of it and then applies it to Malcolm and then applies it to Barack Obama so he can draw this line 
from, from uh, uh, black power through Malcolm to Obama so that he can be well received in the most elite circles to talk about things that should be terrifying those spaces. You know, that's what I'm saying. Like, Malcolm was assassinated by the state. Dr. King was assassinated by the state. These people were killed because of the radical ideas that they engaged to now have them recast as heroes and people who were loved by everybody is a complete falsehood. So if you want, so that's why I'm saying you all are going to really have to do it because these people are creating this brand again that is going to make sure that when we hear black power, we don't hear anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism, redistribution of wealth, armed struggle, uh, 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 people of color unifying against Western imperialism. We hear black elected officials, black capitalism, uh, you know, make another Oprah, make another Obama, make another Russell Simmons, that that's black power. And that's not what Stokely meant. That's not what yeah. Malcolm meant. That's why, by the way, I'm glad you mentioned both of their names, Stokely and Ella Baker are erased from the film Selma. Yeah. Why James Foreman is erased yeah. in who he actually was from, from the movie Selma. Because they don't want you to acknowledge, they don't want you to acknowledge that not only were they there, but they were the most radical, militant, and loved by the people in their community. They don't want you to know that because they don't want you, particularly now that Ferguson and all this stuff is popping <coughs> off and people with Black Lives Matter and all this stuff, they don't want you emulating that. They want you emulating some other version of these things. So that's why, yeah, yeah so, you know, and, and Peniel did it again in his new book, Stokely A Life. Yeah. Completely distorts Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture, completely, you know, denies the importance of his politics, doesn't give, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a sophisticated hit job, is what it is. Uh, anyway, I, I it's, see, it, it, it's important to say, just, just very briefly, it's important to say that, that if we're going to talk about Peniel Joseph, we should say that Peniel Joseph's thesis is that, and I want you to listen to this, he said, don't pay attention to what Malcolm X and Kwame Ture and people like that say. Pay attention to the pragmatic work that they did. Now, that's an interesting way to view that because what he's trying to focus you on is the pragmatic work they did, but the implication is that they did not believe what they said. Now, how are you going to find out what they said? YouTube right now, but not three years from now. But these books are going to be here three years from now. Peniel Joseph and people like him are going to be here three years from now. So this is, this is why this uh, situation is so well constructed. Because if you don't listen to what they say, you don't hear their critique of America. If you just look at the pragmatic things they do, you think, oh, well, then America's correct then which is American liberalism, this idea that America's fine, it has its problems, but they're correctable. And so Peniel produces that. And the scholarship that's coming out now produces and reinforces this idea that America just has problems that can be fixed. I mean, basically, someone told, someone told me this like earlier today, I'm seeing myself we hear all this during, especially during the yes, Vietnam War when you had a lot of college students that were among very highly active and then what's it called, the rise of the hip, the rise of radical hip hop pretty much. Now I'm, we're in 2015 with the Black Lives Matter movement. So basically my question is this, like with all this you're trying to get the, the, the true truth of a black power and pretty much trying to identify yourself this person, how, how can I tell somebody who may feel that they're stuck between a rock, which is capitalistic America, and a hard place, which is Africa, being robbed by these Western imperialist nations, that was, hey, like, what's it called? There's something to be done about us being black, and we we have the power to, to, to determine our own destinies and all that. You say, how do you start that dialogue? Yes. You introduce them to the teachings of Malcolm X, you introduce him to the teachings of Huey Newton, and you start the dialogue there, and say, and say, after you show them those teachings, what's different about what they're saying that was going on right now? Mm. How relevant is what Malcolm X is saying? How relevant is what Huey Newton is saying to what's going on right now? And once you start having that dialogue, and they go, well, it's the same thing. And then you go, oh, well, if it's the same problem, why isn't the solution the same? 